Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and staying healthy during this challenging time with COVID-19. We recognize the hard work that you've been doing through this crisis, and thank you for all that you're doing to keep your residents safe and happy and healthy. Thank you for joining PHCA for today's webinar, CMS Mandates, On-Site Focused Infection Control Surveys, Implications and Strategies. This webinar is geared toward nursing facilities. I'm Wendy Johnson with the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. PHCA offers monthly webinars to members to receive updates from department staff on regulations, learn from industry experts on current trends and practices, and to gain a better understanding of practical application tools to equip you so that you may continue to provide the highest level of quality care possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for PHCA members as well as potential members during the COVID crisis. Credits will be uploaded to NAB within the next two weeks for those who have provided us with your unique NAB number. I'll be sending a link to a quick survey. Your feedback is important to us and to our speaker, so please take a moment to complete the survey. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. However, throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit questions using your questions pane on the right hand of your screen, and our presenter will address them at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being presented by Paula Sanders, co-chair, healthcare practice group, and principal with Post and Shell. On June 1st, CMS issued a new directive to state survey agencies to perform 100% of their focused infection control surveys by July 31st or risk losing a portion of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act supplemental grants. Pennsylvania ranks 46 out of all states, having only conducted 16.3% of such surveys. The national average for SSAs is 51.4%. In addition, CMS has directed SSAs to conduct other COVID-19 surveys and resume some other, some more routine survey activities. CMS is also ratcheting up enforcement for facilities that receive a D or higher with any deficiency associated with infection control requirements. It's anticipated that Pennsylvania will ramp up its on-site inspections in the next days, weeks, and months. This webinar will provide the most up-to-date information about what this enhanced enforcement policy means for nursing homes and strategies to mitigate potentially crippling new enforcement remedies. I'll now turn the webinar over to Paula. Wendy, and uh, good good morning, everybody. Uh, it's always a pleasure to to be here. Uh, I want to start this week's webinar as we did last week with with a word of thanks. Um, just letting you know that we're extremely sensitive uh, to the fact that um, the, the country seems to lost, have, have lost sight of what all of you are doing. Um, the, the national focus on protecting the hospitals from the surge without a, a concomitant emphasis on helping long-term care facilities protect their residents has had unintended but predict, predictable consequences and you, you guys are the heroes, absolutely, and you, you have our deepest gratitude. But I also want to give you uh, words of apology. Um, nursing homes, and throughout the presentation, I'm going to refer to them alternatively as SNFs or nursing homes. You do not deserve to be blamed for the pandemic or the spread of COVID-19. Um, Wendy mentioned at the beginning that uh, we were going to give you the up-to-date information and from Monday when we started uh, responding to the CMS directive about the on-site surveys uh, till yesterday there have been further developments 
which included CMS posting uh, the nursing home specific data on uh, their website, Medicare Compare. Additionally, uh, Seema Verna, who's the uh, administrator for CMS, just had some of the most unbelievable comments uh, addressing what, what she believes is the root cause of all of this. Um, and so we, we see her attitudes both in some of the uh, frequently asked questions as well as in comments. I just wanted to share a couple things with you. One, uh, and this is from the uh, CMS FAQs regarding the reporting, uh, it is a quote that says, when a facility fails to prevent any infectious disease from spreading, they are cited for non-compliance with CMS's infection control requirements. That's not nearly as bad as the story in this morning's Skilled Nursing News report, uh, where she was questioned during an online uh, reporter call. And th this is her quote, which I think sets the stage for the rest of our webinar and our discussion. Uh, quote, I think this idea of trying to finger point and blame the federal government is absolutely ridiculous. Now, she was responding to questions from the audience, uh, both facilities as well as some experts and medical directors, about the view that uh, nursing homes do not receive sufficient support, such as the provision of personal protective equipment, priority access to testing, and supplemental staffing. And the, the question was posed, well, isn't that the reason some of the uh, counts are so high? And she accused that of being finger pointing. I think as we go through, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, we are the whipping post of people trying to explain sort of the inexplicable, right? There, there has to be some reason why nursing homes are seeing the spread. And obviously, from the government's perspective, it's because the nursing homes who have had outbreaks must have done something bad. And um, we're hoping to be able to give you some tools and strategies for helping combat this uh, misperception. Uh, June has been a busy week. We, you know, we started Monday with the uh, new release of the, the QSO memo 20-31-all, which requires on-site surveys and creates financial risk for the states and increasing sanctions for infection control deficiencies, which we'll talk about. But then we have yesterday's posting of the NHSN uh, nursing home data uh, and other documents. I just want to walk you through in case you haven't had a chance to, to take a look at what some of that means. So yesterday, CMS posted the results of 5,700 infection control and complaint surveys. Um, those are surveys that occurred since March 4th, and that survey report is going to be updated monthly. CMS has also released the NHSN data that you all self-reported, including the number of cases and number of deaths, and that's going to be updated weekly. And the data is in downloadable forms so that uh, researchers and plaintiffs' attorneys and whoever else wants to look at this data can look at it. Um, I can tell you right now from our preliminary reviews and having talked to a number of people, um, I don't think this is a case of what would, one would call garbage in, garbage out, because I know a lot of you submitted good data and somehow in the process of transmission, CMS has gotten it totally screwed up. So that just like Pennsylvania, your real numbers are not showing up in these databases. So you need to be extremely careful in what you're reporting and how you're reporting and making sure that your communities and your stakeholders in particular know what your numbers are. Thankfully, it appears that the press is finally beginning to see that there are flaws in the data reporting systems 
and we're seeing more and more stories less focused on, oh, bad nursing home, and more questioning the Department of Health, and I expect CMS as well, about what, what are you doing with these numbers? Because they, they just don't make sense. Um, at some point, the NHSN data is going to show everything that you're re reporting, and this slide just lays out for you all those various elements. Uh, <clears throat> It's more troubling is the fact that they are posting the COVID-related surveys, and that data is coming out both in a spreadsheet listing each health inspection conducted, your demographic information, and the citations generally, but then there's a separate file with the 2567. Um, and because CMS is posting these monthly, and I'll mention this at the end as well, I think it's going to be critically important for people to really start considering um, filing IDRs, even if it's not going to change the scope and severity of a deficiency uh, to the extent that the surveyors are making wrong statements about what they're observing. Um, you want to have some opportunity, hopefully, to correct this. Um, because I, I do believe these 2567s are going to be scrutinized and they're going to be more readily accessible um, for, for comparative purposes since they're all going to be on the CMS website. Um, the surveys from March 4 forward until this ends will not be used to impact your five-star ratings, uh, but you know, there are going to be spreadsheets showing the number of percentages of surveys for, that each state has conducted. So one of the FAQs asked, why do some nursing homes have outbreaks but no deficiencies? And there were a number of, of reasons that CMS put forth. So I want to go over a, a few of them with you. One is the uh, adherence to the long-standing infection control practices is the best defense against the spread. And more importantly, the fact that a nursing home has had a case of infectious disease is not necessarily indicative of noncompliance. This next bullet, though, I, I think is something that you can use defensively and proactively. Um, proper reporting helps access the support needed to control spread and ensures prompt assistance and guidance. Now, remember, we started this discussion by looking at um, Seema's statement that uh, it's not the government's fault and there's a perception that everything was hunky-dory in terms of facilities' ability to get PPE, uh, that there were no staffing shortages, that testing was immediately and continues to be immediately available, and that the directives you were getting from the governments were consistent. And we need to control that message and say, Proper reporting, which you people have been doing uh, for months into Knowledge Center, which is now Corvina, that didn't help you necessarily get supplies or the help that you needed. And often, to the extent that you did get additional PPE, it was not fully usable. For instance, many facilities received N95 masks, but they might have gotten a shipment all the same size. And very, very few facilities received N95 masks with proper fit testing supplies and or training. Which leads us to the truism with the appropriate resources, it is possible to prevent further spread. But I would submit that in almost every nursing home in Pennsylvania, we did not have appropriate resources. And even now, it's too little, too late. Um, the other point that uh, was made by CMS is, you know, some 
some facilities have uh, willingly accepted patients from hospitals or they have dedicated uh, to COVID-19 cases and therefore uh, their counts might seem higher. And in those instances, those were not the result of poor infectious control practices. The corollary being implied here is that everyone else, if you had an outbreak, uh, it was because there were poor infectious control practices. Um, CMS has also taken the position that er their early analysis shows a statistically significant relationship between the inspection star ratings and nursing homes with larger number of cases. Um, there are a number of other researches, uh, research studies that are saying just the opposite. And I've given you a link to an article in Skilled Nursing News um, that very recent that suggests that, in fact, the size of the facility and more importantly, the geography of the facility, the extent of community spread around the facility, and the demographics and racial compositions of the residents and staff also contribute significantly to whether or not um, there has been a spread. As proof that nursing homes still are not a priority, uh, regardless of what the uh, Secretary Levine says on her almost daily press conferences and what the governor has said, uh, here's from their press release, May 28th, about the wonderful job they are doing providing testing supplies. A and you can see that nursing homes are right there at the bottom. They, As of May 28th, they had only distributed 7,070 testing kits to long-term care facilities. Um, makes it a little bit difficult to, to do the testing and you know, we could spend another hour talking about is the testing mandatory? What are the testing strategies and everything else? That, that That's beyond the scope of our discussion today. But I did want to give you this statistic because it's always nice to go back to uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak, and, and have this at your fingertips when people say, well, I don't understand. Why are you saying nursing homes are the stepchild of the healthcare system? you can point to this statistic and say, we're not making it up. We are an afterthought, notwithstanding the fact that now we are at, and I believe have always been at the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, this is certainly not indicative of a system that is trying to give appropriate support to your facilities, your staff, and your residents and families. So, what lies ahead for the Pennsylvania Department of Health and uh, Pennsylvania nursing homes, as well as the other states, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on Pennsylvania here. So on June 1, CMS reversed course and is, has now mandated that every nursing home in the country have a on-site infection control focused survey. You know, Pennsylvania has been doing uh, remote focused infection control surveys, as have other states, but there was never a requirement that every nursing home in the country have this survey. I mean, you, you look in uh, the Federal Register, you look in the Code of Federal Regulations, the State Operations Manual, the Social Security Act, nowhere will you see a requirement for any surveys other than complaint surveys and uh, the annual surveys that or recertification surveys for purposes of our discussion today. But now we have this new one and um, CMS is feeling the pressure. So in, in typical fashion for this administration, they've created an arbitrary deadline and they've told all the states you have to complete 100% of on-site focused infection control surveys by July 31. If the state survey agency does not complete that survey, the 100% of them by July 31, 
they have to submit a corrective action plan to CMS telling CMS how they're going to get whatever remains done within 30 days, which takes us to the end of August. So in essence, I give about 90 days for Pennsylvania to get all of these surveys done. If they don't get that those done, they're going to lose 10% of their CARES Act fiscal year 2021 allocation. Um, we've not been able to determine how much money that is. Uh, the, the most recent allocation for the Department of Health that we were able to find shows it's about $10 million. Um, this is for the new allocations, which I don't know have been um, announced yet. If the state agencies continue to fail to hit that 100%, let's say they go into September, uh, for each month thereafter, they could lose potentially another 5% reduction. Now, in a, an interesting twist, the CMS is also going to reward those states that do hit the 100% completion by July 31, and they've said, okay, you good states, you hit that, and we're going to give you a proportion of whatever the bad states have forfeited. So that, that money is going to go into a pool to be split up by those more effective states. Um, starting in fiscal year 2021, states are also going to have to complete annual focus surveys, infection control surveys, on at least 20% of all the state's nursing homes, or they could risk losing up to another 5% of allocations under the CARES Act, which suggests to me that these infection focused infection control surveys are not going away. Is Pennsylvania at risk? I, I think we have a, a, a problem here. If According to the CMS data that was released on July, on June 1, Pennsylvania had only completed 113 on-site focused infection control surveys, uh, which is about 16.3%. National average is about 54%. As Wendy had mentioned at the beginning, this puts Pennsylvania 46th out of all the states. Um, I'm not a whiz at math, but I think when I looked at the numbers, I was calculating 582 more on-site surveys as of the date that CMS released that data. Um, that's just on the infection control surveys. I have heard uh, from a number of uh, facilities that the state is coming in and, and doing very quick infection control surveys to try and uh, close out the surveys that may have been conducted remotely, and many of you may have experienced an off-site infection control survey where they were keeping the survey open. Um, so they may be trying to use this process now to close them up, but 582 is an awful lot to, to get done by July 31 to be eligible for the bonus pool, so to speak. Uh, but that's not the only surveys that they have to com complete in order to uh, maintain their full CARES Act allocation. They also have to conduct on-site COVID-19 focus surveys at any facility with previous COVID-19 outbreaks. And those surveys have to be done within 30 days of the date of that memo, which takes us to July 1. So what's a co how does CMS define previous COVID-19 outbreaks? And you all should sit here and figure out if you fall into any of these buckets. Did you have cumulative confirmed cases at 10% of your bed capacity or greater? Or cumulative confirmed plus suspected cases at 20% of your bed capacity or 10 or more deaths? If you fall into one of those three buckets and you have not had an on-site COVID-19 focus survey, you're going to have one before the end of this month in all likelihood if Pennsylvania is going to try to hit their benchmark. So we've got the infection control surveys. We've got these previous COVID-19 outbreak surveys. 
And then within three to five days, the Department of Health is going to be required to do an on-site COVID-19 focus survey of any nursing home who reports three or more new COVID suspected and confirmed cases in uh, to the NHSN and or an on-site focus survey at any nursing home that reports one confirmed resident case in a facility that was previously COVID free. Which raises a question about the admissions process here in Pennsylvania, right? So, so the NHSN system doesn't distinguish between facility acquired and facility admitted COVID-19 cases. You've heard, if you've listened to the Secretary of Health this week on her press conference, she was asked why were hospitals being told to send uh, COVID positive patients to nursing homes. And her response was, well, that's where they came from. We're just sending them back home. But in fact, begs the question because early on, nobody was really doing testing. So we don't know. Um, and there's a perception here uh, that maybe it's okay to take a positive patient from the hospital. However, in Pennsylvania, hospitals are only required to swab and test before discharge. They're not required to hold a patient until they get the results of the test. Now, the HAN, the Health Advisory Bulletin from the department, says facilities can only refuse to admit a patient if the hospital hasn't tested them. Um, we have heard from the department, although not in writing, that they will not cite patient, uh, facilities who uh, refuse to admit until they know that the health status, the COVID posit positivity uh, or negativity uh, of a patient. But it's something you, you may want to consider when you're looking at all of these other elements now, uh, because admitting someone, if you've been COVID free, who turns out to be COVID positive, will result in you having a survey under these guidelines within three to five days after uh, you report that positive admission. Um, and the flip side of that, just to keep in mind, is you may be uh, creating some tense relationships with your hospital partners uh, if you insist on waiting for the positive or negative results. So surveyors need to be prepared, but are they? When there's a whole question about PPE, uh, CMS is, is told the state survey agencies that they must ensure that the surveyors have needed PPE uh, and surveyors must be medically cleared and trained in the pr proper use of respirators, safe removal and disposal, and medical contraindications to respirator use. Um, we understand that uh, there are surveyors right now in the department who are being trained, uh, but we're not sure what the department's response is going to be on how they're going to meet these deadlines given their current staff needs um, and the overall preparedness of the survey teams. Now, CMS is also giving states additional flexibility to expand beyond the priority surveys. Um, they're now being allowed to do complaint investigations that are triaged as non-immediate jeopardy high. Pennsylvania's already been doing these. Um, they are now allowed to do revisits of any facility that's had um, immediate jeopardy removed, but is still out of compliance. Uh, they're allowed to restart uh, recertification surveys for special focus facilities and special focus facility candidates. And if, if your recertification is more than 15 months overdue, right? So generally the department is required to survey between eight and 15 months annually. Um, now, if you're over eight, 15 months, uh, the department has the authority 
to come in and that should say SNFs and intermediate care facilities for uh, individuals with intellectual disability. So they can do those. Surveys still are required to be prioritized based on a facility's prior survey history and allegations related to abuse or neglect, infection control, transfer discharge, insufficient staffing or competency, or other quality of care issues. Uh, through this memo, CMS has also expanded the role of the quality improvement organizations. Um, they have specifically deployed the QIOs to approximately 3,000 quote unquote low performing nursing homes with a history of infection control challenges. Um, they're also being deployed to provide assistance to other homes for technical assistance. Um, the states may also request QIO help. Uh, QIOs are providing uh, weekly national infection control training and it's not like you have more time in the day than you need, but um, you're, you might want to have somebody sit in on those weekly calls so you can document that you're taking advantage of the resources that the government is putting out there because their story is we're making all these resources available in bad nursing homes. You know, they're not doing infection control right and they're not taking advantage of all of the wonderful things we've made available to them. Um, they have also, uh, in a true spirit of, of this current administration, rather than uh, walking hand, hand in hand and side by side helping you, they have determined that there's a heightened threat to resident health and safety for even low level isolated infection control citations, such as proper hand washing and use of PPE. And they believe the only way to ensure ongoing compliance at, with fundamental health and safety protocols is to punish you more. And these next two slides, I'm not gonna take much time going over. You can read them at your leisure and you know, let us know if you have questions about them. But they are looking at both the current deficiency, and that would be you know, your scope and severity going down the left-hand side of these slides, and comparing that to whether or not, or, or what your infection control history has been in the past. So, Let's just use, for example, you know, if you had a, D, a level D or E, which they consider not widespread potential for harm, if you've had no infection control deficiencies in the past year, you're going to get a directed plan of correction with a root cause analysis requirement. If you had uh, infection control deficiencies cited once in the past year, in addition to the directed plan of correction, you're going to get a what they call a discretionary denial of payment for new admissions with 45 days to demonstrate compliance and a per instance civil money penalty that could be up to $5,000 at the state's discretion. If you have been cited twice or more in the past two years for an infection control deficiency, in addition to getting the, the directed plan of correction, you're going to get a uh, discretionary denial of payment for new admissions with 30 days to demonstrate your compliance with infection control deficiencies, a $15,000 per instance CMP or a per day CMP as long as the total amount exceeds $15,000, which the language there doesn't make sense. Don't ask me what that means. We've reached out to the American Healthcare Association who's reaching out to CMS to see if they can get further clarification. But I wanted to demonstrate to you visually how your past history is gonna have an impact directly on these infection control violations. And um, you know, simple hand washing failure could, could trigger a D, an E, depending on how many people they see, it could be an F. Um, sort of hard to show the actual harm, um, but they could jump right over actual harm to immediate jeopardy, um, which includes a mandatory remedy of a temporary manager or termination, uh, direct a plan of correction, a denial of discretionary denial of payment of new admissions, 15 days to demonstrate compliance, 
and a civil money penalty imposed at the highest amount option in the CMP analytic tool. So those are what those deficiencies could look like tied to uh, the penalties. Um, uh, draconian doesn't begin to describe it. Wrongheaded comes much closer. Certainly ill-advised when you look at the substantial additional amounts of unfunded obligations you all have incurred in hiring uh, temporary staff in getting gouged for PPE, trying to figure out how you're gonna pay for uh, testing if you somehow don't magically get free testing from the state. So what are some of the action steps you need to be thinking about right away? I would venture that most facilities in the state are gonna get a visit uh, survey within the next 90 days. First thing I would do is Talk to your greeter or receptionist and drill them senseless so they know not to let the surveyors in without completing the screening. You know, the surveyors, some may come in and say, I'm with the state or I'm with the feds. I don't need to be have my temperature tested. Your team needs to know that's not true. They need to take temps and they need to have the screening asked. Um, they're also gonna be observing to see what the receptionist does with staff and visitors who, well, visitors is probably the wrong term, but other people who are coming into the building during this time. Um, no one should get past the receptionist or greeter without going through the full screening process and making sure as well that they're PPE is in place before they walk any further. Um, some of the deficiencies that we're seeing appear to be tied to staff believing they don't have to have their um, masks on until they're on a resident floor. This department is taking the position that you know, once they cross the threshold, they need to be fully decked in their appropriate PPE. Um, if you haven't already looked at the CMS infection control focus survey checklist and self-assessment, I would review it, I would complete it, I would update it. Surveyors are gonna be using this tool to do the focused infection control surveys. So you know what they're looking at, you should be doing the same thing. Uh, some surveyors have been asking to see copies of the facility completed self-assessments. So even though it's not a requirement, uh, you may want to have that completed. And if you did it early on when this all started and came out, I would suggest that you do a, a, a more recent one. And then because these surveyors do not want to be in your buildings, uh, particularly if you have COVID, um, have as much prepared as you possibly can already gathered in a survey book. So when they walk in, you know what they're asking for and you've got it pulled together. Um, I would be doing monitoring of staff practices every shift. I would remind staff as much as possible about the proper use of PPE and that the rules apply when they cross the threshold. Um, facilities are getting cited because two staff members are observed walking down the hall from the reception desk, not social distancing, or with their um, mask not fully on. You want to make sure that you're enforcing social distancing at lunch and on breaks, and, and that would also include making sure that people aren't putting their sodas on counters. You know, it's real strict infection control. Uh, practices which in earlier days might not have generated any sort of citation now can, sub can subject you um, to all sorts of deficiencies, but also violations of these infection control protocols helps the government support their th theme that this wasn't a rampant virus that nobody control, could control. Instead, this is the result of poor practices in facilities. 
walk the buildings, you know, don't sit in your office. You, you need to be on the floor seeing what's going on with your staff. Um, and I would, I would make sure you're including the, your frontline staff, have them get buy-in to help with monitoring and reinforcing the infection control best practices. And to the extent that it hurts your head, do it anyway, think like a surveyor. When you walk up to your front door, what is your signage saying? When you're walking down the hall, you know, are, are there open cans of soda on the nurse's station? What's on the med cart? What are people doing in terms of hand hygiene in between uh, residents? Also look at your facility assessments, you know, update them. You, know, you should probably have a section in your facility assessment that talks about taking care of COVID positive residents. You know, to the extent you have other issues regarding staffing supplies or resident needs, um, that should probably be in that facility assessment uh, and maybe in your emergency plans. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I think, because there's not enough time in the day, is to update your policies to reflect changes in procedures. I know that your wonderful DONs are doing a great job when new guidance comes out and you're, that's being communicated to the nursing staff, but it's not being memorialized well enough in many instances in your actual policies. And if you can dedicate someone to making sure there's a tie-in between what you're doing and what your policies say, I, I would put that at a fairly high priority. Um, and don't lose sight as well of the resident quality of life issues because the surveyors are certainly going to look at that if they see something of concern. And those include, you know, worsening ADLs, depression, isolation, just as examples. Um, review and update your emergency plan. Uh, gather documentation of your training and competencies. Again, you know, those stand-up meetings, how is that being documented? Do you have documentation to show that you are reaching not just your nursing staff, but also housekeeping and dietary and security? You know, everyone in the building should have a basic competency about the infection control practices as they affect what those individuals are responsible for doing. Um, and, you know, Look, look at those documents carefully. Um, I've seen quite a few of them recently that are missing things like dates. So there'll be a title, but there's not a corresponding uh, training that supports what the sign-in sheets reflect. So try and pull those things together. Have them again in that survey book. Uh, because I think it's a matter for just about every home in the state, except unless you were one of those 113 and you've had no COVID cases, or you were one of those 113 and you've also had a COVID focused survey, you might be okay under this, um, but I, I wouldn't guarantee it. So I, I'm looking at this as all hands on deck. Um, I would ask staff questions from the survey tools because we know that the the surveyors are going to be asking staff um, when they were doing off-site surveys. Uh, sometimes you were able to uh, select what staff would be responding to the surveyors. You're not going to have that option once they're in your building. Um, it, it, the other piece I want to just share with you is it's important for your staff to know what standard and transmission-based precautions are appropriate and required for individual residents because the surveyors may not know and they may assume a certain resident needs a certain type of uh, transmission-based precaution. Uh, so you want to have your staff conversant with the needs of each individual resident. Uh, Turning over to some of the other issues, you want to make sure uh, that someone is making all the required reporting and that it's being done accurately and timely. I, I know some of you are reporting up to seven different platforms. Um, you're reporting to different platforms 
doesn't need to be consistent, meaning what you say to the Department of Health may not be consistent with what you're reporting to NHSN because they're using different time frames. And what you do want to make sure is that your internal data always ties out, right? Because that's your data is the best. I don't know where where the government is pulling some of their numbers from. For those of you who might still be having trouble with inaccuracies, uh, in the data or accessing the reporting sites, I would be sending emails and keeping track of every correspondence you're sending to document uh, your problems in accessing or with the uh, inconsistencies so that there is, there is a record. And that will help you too in the dialogues with your families. Um, keep documentation of the communications one of the things in the COVID focus surveys that the surveyors are instructed to do is to reach out to the families and ask them what they know. And I know that uh, it's like going into a resident council meeting where they're talking to someone with the BIMS of three who says, well, I, I never heard this. And you know that you gave them the document the surveyor is asking about. Same thing's gonna happen with families, right? The families, many of them, are angry because they can't visit. They're confused beyond belief because whatever numbers you're telling them certainly don't match the numbers that the Department of Health is reporting, and now they're not gonna match the numbers that the C CMS is reporting. So you, you have a lot of PR damage control to do. I would keep documentation of your communications. If you're using a recorded line, I would periodically test it to make sure it's working and maintain copies of the scripts so that you can show the department if they come in or the federal surveyors, there are quite a few of them in, the, in Pennsylvania right now. And you can say, this is, this is what we have been telling staff. This is what we've been telling families. This is what we've been telling residents. I would document all your attempts to get clarification and guidance and assistance from local, state, and federal agencies uh, some of the email responses I've seen, particularly uh, on the local side, I think will prove to be quite helpful uh, to centers in the event of litigation down the road. Um, I've seen quite a few from all over the country where people are saying, I don't, I don't know, nobody told us about that. I don't know. I didn't know they were doing this. So, you know, those, those kind of communications you may early to the extent you can have them memorialized in writing, that would be uh, something you, you may want to look for. Uh, then that would include emails to your vendors as well as contracts that reflect supply delays or shortages as well as increased costs. You know, document, document, document. I can't tell you that enough. Be prepared to file informal dispute resolutions. You may not change scope and severity, uh, but, you, but you may change some of that perception and some of the things that the surveyors are writing. Uh, now, the Department of Health has shared some of the common findings of things they're seeing in facilities. Um, and, and the first one, is a recognition, I think, that they, they, they know your staff, they're fatigued, but the fatigue is causing lank, lax PPE usage. I mean, an example would be the masks below the nose. Um, I know that um, for some, it's really hard to explain to your staff why they need to do it when they see the president not wearing a mask or more recently, the governor walking in, in a um, protest with more than 250 people and then getting up in front of that crowd and taking his mask off. Uh, you know, and I've gotten questions, well, why, why do we have to do it if they're not? And the, the answer is because we do, right? This is the right thing to do. This is the proper infection control procedures, but it does make it, it difficult to, um, lead your teams when we're not always getting consistent leadership from the top. Um, another finding is um, improper or no hand hygiene. 
people not changing gloves properly and as frequently as they're required to be changed, or you know, hand gel not being appropriately used, or just people just not doing it at all. Um, the other one, which is, has been a problem even before COVID, is cleaning of reusable resident devices, uh, that's thermometers, pulse ox, blood pressure cuffs, and glucometers, and not following the manufacturer's recommendations. Now, many of you have been unable to locate the types of wipes that are recommended by the uh, manufacturer, and there are alternatives that you can be using that match the equivalent alcohol content without necessarily destroying or uh, damaging the efficacy of the equipment. But you need to document that as well as why you're doing it, when you started, and what your expected return to normal is. And then make sure your staff knows because sometimes they, they grab the wrong thing. Um, but this area can, can, can hit you into immediate jeopardy. Uh, so something you want to be extremely sensitive to. Um, moving forward, if you can identify when you first had your positive cases and look at what guidance was in effect at that time. For many of you, your first case happened even before we were required to do universal masking. And that helps play into and helps you support your narrative of why this was not a breakdown of infection control. It was an, a breakdown in understanding and direction from the government about what was at, at hand with the coronavirus. Same thing goes for cohorting. So many of you were not able to cohort when you wanted to uh, because it, at one point the direction was if you've got one positive resident, your whole floor is positive. So there was no cohorting. Testing continues to remain an issue and you can only, you know, you'll be able to pull back to the um, slide from the governor's press conference. Um, also, you know, were you optimizing PPE? Didn't you have PPE? I mean, were you wearing ponchos? You know, were you having community folks making gowns? You, you need to have documented those timelines because that's going to help show a different picture. Um, shortages or insufficient PPE, which we talked about, the N95s, fit testing materials is another example. And then finally, you know, moving forward, you need to seize control of the narrative. Don't let the government's negatives define who you are. We have to combat the misstatements with the truth and be proud of what you do and celebrate your, your successes. And remember, it's you and your staff, you guys are the heroes. Um, and, and we need to recognize that. At the end, uh, we've given you the infection tags, uh, just so you see what they are. And the CMS links to the most recent uh, June 4th uh, issuances from the Department of Health, um, from, I'm sorry, from CMS. And I think, Wendy, at that point, we've saved a very little time. I apologize for not giving you more time for questions, but I'm happy to take them. Paula, thanks for that great information. You know, I, I think it was really important to, to get all of that out to everybody. So we'll do our best to get through these questions. And if not, we'll just do a Q&A document and get it out to everybody because I think it's you know, um, I do think we'll just take a run a little bit over. And if anybody needs to jump off, you know, we certainly understand. Um, but uh, that was really great information that you shared, Paula. Thank you for that. So we do have quite a few questions that have already come in. So let me get started on those. How do you get incorrect data fixed? Who do we contact? Great question. It depends on where the errors are. So if they're in the NHSN data, you have to get in touch with the help desk through CDC. If it's in the uh, HAP data, the Knowledge Center data, 
you need to, I, I would send an email to the HAP question line and also to the RA account at the Department of Health. And um, if, if you're a PHCA member, certainly um, Gail and Chris can help with that. And I don't know, Gail, if you're on the line, um, do you have those specific email addresses or we could put them up, Wendy, with this, you know, when, when uh, you send out the survey, if that works? You bet. Yep. I, I don't have them at my fingertip. I apologize. Okay, next question. Have you heard if COVID outbreak surveys may be combined with infection control surveys? Yes, absolutely. You know, and I, I think we were, if I was, that's, I would be combining them if they were, if they were required. So if, if you are a facility that falls into one of the, that COVID, prior COVID outbreak, and you haven't had an on-site infection control, I would expect you to have both components at one time. Okay. Uh, here's a, I thought the reporting would not count the new admissions that are positive as being part of your COVID acquired numbers. Is that not correct? I think it was on one of the memos. To my knowledge, and again, it, it varies on which data source you're reporting to, they are including positives regardless of whether they're facility acquired or, or new admissions. Okay, uh, here's some more on admissions. Are we allowed to hold off on admissions until test results are obtained. Recent PA HANS hands are advising that we should not be using positive COVID results as a reason to refuse admissions and that we shouldn't be waiting to admit someone with a pending result. Will we be penalized if we're refusing to admit so someone for COVID-19 reasons? We have, it, let me put, it, it's our understanding that uh, although the, the, the Han, and I know exactly the Han you're talking about, says it's not a reason for not taking an admission. If you don't think you can take the admission, you should not be cited. Um, I, and I think that your standing to do that is probably greater if, you are currently COVID free, uh, but there is certainly a conflict within the Department of Health over this specific issue. That, as I mentioned before, you may run into, uh, you know, a problem with your referring hospitals if you're not taking them. You really need to be able to assess, do you have the capabilities to uh, isolate the a new admission uh, for 14 days. And there, there may be legitimate reasons why you cannot take that admission. You will, however, be cited if you refuse to take back one of your own residents. I, this, this, I'm talking specifically here, addressing a, a, a new admission, not someone um, you've sent out uh, to the hospital. Okay, here's more on admissions. I understand the imp uh, the implications of admitting a stable COVID-19 patient to a SNF, but it also seems unethical to deny anyone with COVID. It's almost blacklisting these individuals. Many times they come to a SNF because they have nowhere else to go. Where do they go now if they have nowhere but a uh, diagnosis of COVID? Uh, does seem doesn't seem right to deny, rather should use appropriate PPE, et cetera. Thoughts on this? Well, I, I, I agree with the, with the question and each, 
each facility has to make its own assessment of their ability to take care of patients. So there, there are some patients that we're hearing about who test positive for 45 days. You know, we don't know if they're throwing the virus, but it really depends on the facility's ability to cohort properly uh, on these new admissions. There, there may be some facilities that are not able to take to take that admission, and, and we would never suggest a, a blanket, we're not taking X, Y, or Z, just like we don't say we're never taking a registered sex offender, right? It's a case-by-case -case analysis. So it, to, to the extent the questioner thought I was suggesting a, a blackballing of COVID positive patients, I was not suggesting that at all. It's a, it's a much more facility-specific analysis that needs to be done. Okay. Uh, back to uh, one of the earlier uh, questions and comments. I regard in regard to um, DDPNA, DOH has not been doing surveys, even desk audits, to close open tags. Has there been any word about the normal 90-day DDPNA window? We had a an open tag with a date. Uh, with a date certain of March 24th that DOH is just leaving open because they're not doing those surveys? That's a great, great question. And thank, thank you for raising it. Um, I should have mentioned it during the, during the presentation. So there's two separate sets of survey things going on right now. The old, the, let's call it the pre-COVID, so the, the pre-COVID surveys, those are in suspended animation. The deep, the, the normal denial of payment for new admissions for not coming into compliance within 90 days, the um, normal termination if you're not back in compliance for 180 days, for pre-COVID surveys, all of that is suspended. However, for these COVID-related surveys, so there are surveys that have happened March 4th going forward, what they're talking about is not the 90, what we would call the normal 90 day denial of payment for new admissions. This is the discretionary denial of payment for new admissions and it's discretionary because it's not tied to that clock. So you've got to put your surveys into different buckets. Your, your pre COVID ones are in suspended animation. Your current surveys, that's you've got this denial of this discretionary denial of payment for new admissions that's going to be applied. But your plan of correction, and this is like the other weird thing if you get a, a letter, your plan of correction, you have uh, the choice to wait until um, the emergency is lifted before you file your plan of correction. Um, so it's it's a very confusing time period, um, but the, the the DPNA I wouldn't worry about the the normal DPNA or the term 180 day termination clocks. Those are, those are completely suspended. Okay, several more questions. So we'll try to get to as many as we can here. Do we have a repository of all the guides by date issued? Do we, meaning PHCA? I, I'm thinking that's, yeah, probably Chris and Gail question. I'm assuming that we do, but let us um, let me let me touch base and get that out um, and touch base with Chris and Gail, and uh, okay. we'll answer that uh, directly there. Uh, what about what about reusing masks? Is that still allowed? What about reusing? Yes. Yeah. You would need to follow the CMS guidance on optimization of PPE. Uh, and I don't know what kind of mask the person is asking about, if it's uh, N95s or um, 
you know, sur surgical masks. I mean, and, and that, again, is, is part of the problem with, with all of this and, and why it's so troubling is because the, the, the normal standards of care that we were used to pre-COVID don't apply. Um, and we're not sure when these surveyors come in how in touch they are going to be with current guidances with respect to practices that may seem uh, out of the ordinary, uh, which, which is why I think it's important to be well armed and well prepared uh, with understanding of what is and is not allowed at this point in time. Okay. If there is no data reported as of yesterday on the CMS CDC website, although you know that your facility has submitted data through the NHNSN, uh, who do you contact? I, I would contact your field office just to let them know. And I would also contact um, the folks at NHSN. Let me just, while, while we're talking, I'll just see if I can get a, an email for them. But it, if not, Wendy, we can send that email uh, with the follow-up. Okay. I would certainly document, though, that you've submitted it. Sounds good. Okay, um, requirements for the CDC were to report from May 1st forward with previous time periods being optional. Will facilities have any issues if they do not report any cases prior to that date? No. And in, in fact, um, I, I think that CMS has now realized that they left it optional and as a result, some people reported back uh, to their first case, which might have predated, and others did not. So the validity of their data, you know, if I were a statistician, I'd have a heck of a time trying to make any uh, statistically valid statements because it's comparing apples and oranges. Okay. When will we know if baseline testing is mandated to reopen? Oh, whoever knows that has got a miracle brain. I have no idea. The, the state has vacillated so many different times on that issue. I would just stay tuned is, is the best I can tell you. Um, I, I have not heard of any specific date and um, CMS most recently indicated that their guidelines may be changing again, so. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, okay, so it says, but what if the survey was pre-COVID with an IDR filed but not resolved? What's the status? The status is still in suspended animation. There's not, the, it's as if time stopped on that particular survey. The department has been issuing some IDR responses sporadically, uh, but if you haven't had one, it's you, you can maybe reach out to, to the department. I don't know that that's gonna be real helpful at this period of time. Um, I do have the user support for NHSN and that is N H S N, like Nancy Harry, Sam Nancy, at cdc.gov. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. I'll include that in the follow up. Um, I have from Gail uh, we are working on an index of guidance um, in the early stages of development. So it sounds like we uh, don't have that. Uh, repository of the guides um, by date of issue, but we're working on it. So stay tuned for that. All right, we'll take one more question. Will standard surveys return in the future or combined with in infection control surveys? It, my current understanding, again, su subject to being proven wrong by the government, 
is that standard surveys are going to return. Um, I've heard two different things. One is after the pandemic, and the other one is as soon as they catch up on these infection control surveys. Uh, but I think the infection control surveys are going to be uh, a, a separate component, at least as of yet, as of the guidance from yesterday. Awesome. Great. Again, great information. Um, stay tuned. You know, I'm sure we'll have uh, more information going forward and, and look for more COVID-related webinars. We have another one coming up next week on behavioral health issues. Obviously, um, you know, I think all of us can benefit. Um, you know, this was something out of left field for everybody. Um, and I'm sure, you know, uh, you could all use some guidance on how to um, assist your uh, your residents with the self isolation and you know a lot of the the areas where they're um, being challenged and um, you know just not you know in their normal setting and and maybe sometimes not understanding you know everything that's that's behind you know the precautions that are being taken so um, that is next. Tuesday, June 9th, if you've not already signed up for it. Again, we're going to be sending out a survey. Um, please take a moment to uh, to complete it. It's very helpful for us and our speaker. Paula, thank you so much for the, for the very timely information. We'll continue to, here at PHCA, to um, continue to, you know, stay up to date and abreast of um, all of the, you know, the current uh, information on uh, related to COVID and we'll continue to uh, search out topics um, of relevance in this area and, and get those webinars out to you. So um, stay tuned, keep an eye out um, in our in our PHCA daily um, emails that go out, our website, and um, you know if there's anything that you want to see us present, please um, just Send me an email or give me a call. We're we're happy to uh, to search that out and and get it um, scheduled for you. So just want to wish everybody a great remainder of your day. It is Friday, so have a great weekend. Continue to um, stay well, and um, you know, thank you again. Uh, we just can't thank you enough for what you're doing out there to keep your residents safe and and happy and and uh, healthy. And uh, y'all are are rock stars. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you.